on this episode of Rebel Spirit Radio. I mean, it's 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 part of faith, having like faith in like the magical, the mystical, that there's something mm-hmm. beyond us. And I've seen it too. I've seen it too, where my ancestors stepped in and like, oh, honey, you you want to sell that your prior house? <laughs> Sold it in less than two weeks. You know, like mm-hmm. different miracles. Like along with allowing that too, they also provide guidance, mm-hmm. solace. They also guide us. They also, and we also help them. You know, it's it's this beautiful reciprocal relationship that we can develop that goes beyond the mundane because without the mundane, we can get depressed. Life is boring. What what is the richness? Oh, buying something, getting this, getting mm-hmm. that, getting that. Like after a while, that gets dull. Mm-hmm. We need like that's where the magic is. That's where the beauty is at in life is connecting to something beyond that we can see, something that we can feel in our hearts and our souls and our spirits that's where the magic happens and that's how you know a lot of people that come to me to press it's like I one of my first questions is like how's your faith they're like well I don't go to religion like no 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 no. (laughs) not talking about religion I'm talking about like how's your faith what do you believe in let's talk about that welcome to rebel spirit radio Exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this week's episode, Curandera and author Erica Buenaflor joins me to discuss her book, Veneration Rites of Curandurismo. Erica shares her training and background and how she is the epitome of the wounded healer. She talks about ancestors and social justice, the distinction between cultural appropriation and misappropriation, and how we all need to decolonize our minds. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. Erica Buenaflor has a master's degree in religious studies with a focus on Mesoamerican shamanism from the University of California at Riverside. A practicing curandera for more than 20 years, Descended from a long line of grandmother curanderas, she has studied with Curander X in Mexico, Peru, and Los Angeles, and gives presentations on curanderismo in many settings. She is the author of several books, including Cleansing Rites of Curanderismo. She joins me today to discuss her latest book, Veneration Rites of Curanderismo. Sorry, I slaughtered that a little bit, but Erica, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. No worries. You're good. Yeah. It was good. It was good. Oh, yeah. I try. I try. I don't know. Uh, I should have had water or something. I do want to start with this question for anyone in the listening audience who are, is viewing this who is unfamiliar. What is a curandera? And what is curanderismo? But first, I also wanted to make note of the day that we were recording this. Because I think that's also important because it's All Saint All, All Saints Day, right? And so this is part of the major holiday that you're writing about in some ways, beginning with Halloween, All Hallows Eve, the today, All Saints Day, and then tomorrow, of course, is All Souls Day, Dio de la um, Muerto, the Day of the Dead. That is correct. Yeah. So okay, so curanderismo, it's essentially at its basic core, it's a latin american shamanic healing practice its roots are in with the indigenous peoples of the americas what i focus on are what we know and what we've called or termed mesoamerica which is essentially central mexico and also what we identify what has also been termed the maya Mm. you know that and that that includes the totsi the tetza lacandon you know everyone that the anthropologists have identified as maya as being Mesoamerica. So that's the roots of it, but it has a long, 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 you know, we've we've integrated a lot of different other practices as well. Right. Neo-Christian, everything from Native American to also, of course, Catholicism, Christianity, also African practices, various other indigenous practices as well. So it's a kind of a, synchronistic or syncretic practice excuse me it's it's been developed it's been developed as many things it's been very much developed and as i mentioned it's something that you know it's unique it's how we have in some ways well not in some ways we have still sustained and have 
continue to practice our mm -hmm. traditions in ways that are that relate to us that make sense to us to, today and that are relatable to us and you've been practicing this for 20 years um is this something that uh you learned while growing up or if not how did you get involved how did you enter onto this path so i mean it's it's honestly like over well 25 years. i've been saying like for a long time i was saying over 18 years and i was like oh it's more than that this is 18 years now it's 25 like, it's over 20. so it's been a little while so i mean definitely my my great great grandmother was a very well-known curandera mm -hmm. in uh, chihuahua mexico so a lot of people went to her for different kinds of heal like different kinds of illnesses you name it right everything from physical and she could heal anyone with plants and like with anything right and of course also soul illnesses you know we call susto so, you know, so, so loss, you know, in various other kinds of things. And, and, and from that we had stories. And then my great grandmother, her daughter, she, she healed with cooking. You know, mm. she really did like, he, like she could heal anything like with her, her cooking was amazing. And I was blessed to be around that until I was about eight years old. And then, you know, my grandmother went the more Western route. She went to nursing school. So, I mean, like those, those traditions and what we did, like they still, like they were still like passed on. We talked about them, but then, you know, when I came here to the States, because most of my family is still in Mexico, it was very much a disassociation. Hmm. So it wasn't until I got to, to college that I had an opportunity with in my Chicanic studies. And, you know, I was, I was, I'm fortunate to have like really, I had really cool professors that I did well in school. So they let me do in a lot of independent study courses. So I, I studied curanderismo and like its effects, what it looked like today. So I studied it because I was still in very much in my heart. Mm. And, and then what happened was during that time when I was, when I was studying at UCLA, it was at the time where there were still, it was a little bit, before, it was a little bit after I was, went there in 90, it was 93 was when they had the hunger strike. They had a hunger strike to have the, they had a Chicanic studies department, right? Because that's what they wanted. We wanted that, right? Um, we want because it was also me when I got there later. And but what happened after the hunger strike was they got the Cesar Chavez Center. The the department didn't happen till later. But when I got there, there were still we there were still walkouts going on. There was still very much a sentiment of social justice, getting involved, and you know I I just got in that whirlwind of it. And um, even though curanderismo was very much at my heart, so was social justice. So those two things were very much intertwined and you know fast forwarding i you know i did become a labor organizer and then eventually i went to law school mm -hmm. you know and and while i was in law school i actually went to the yucatan and actually met you know i met just out of all synchronicity it was this beautiful like flow of synchronicities my first two mentors that i continued study with for about a little less than seven years mm -hmm. and they, they just taught me how to do various types of what we call limpias which are like like we use like different things, like everything from an egg to herbs, to flowers, to you name it, to cleanse, mm -hmm. to open pathways, right. To work with herbs um, and various other things with, with candles. And they taught me a lot. And then um, I was already an attorney at that time and I was still studying with them, but I was very much living two lives. Um, Cause those were, you know, there was like me, the attorney that like me and like, like, and I was, I was in the flow of like studying and, and I was very much involved in that, but it was still very separate nonetheless, right? And then um, in 2005, I had an accident. I fell off a cliff. I had a catastrophic injury. I had a skull fracture, brain hemorrhage, left AC dissociated, two vertebrae in my back fractured. I completely shattered my coccyx. Left leg, I fractured in three places. Right leg, knee down, all of my bones shattered and came out of my heel. I also got severe osteomyelitis and I... I I was almost going to have an amputation mm. and I was in wheelchair for almost a year. But during that time, I put everything into practice, everything that I had learned. So that's when and it was after that time, it was, you know, I went back to work for a little while, but then it was like, what am I doing? Because <laughs> mm. it was, it was really, I was, I, I was trying to make it work, but that's the thing I was trying, you know, it was, it was a space of like moving from, from, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm providing, you know, work. I'm providing certain types of band-aids. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the work that I wanted to do, right? 
So, and then I, I took a break from everything. I actually went to grad school. That was my break. <laughs> <laughs> that was my break. You know, I went to grad school. <laughs> I got a master's degree in religious studies, not much of a break, but that, that was my break, my sabbatical, so to speak. And I mean, it was, it was, I was just flowing. I was reading in the codices and, and I really just, really just delved like right into my Quranidismo practices. Like that's all I did. I just was like living, breathing it. And I just be, and, and the next thing you know, it was just like, then it was like, it was just progressive. It was like progressive, like building my practice and even more. And, and here I am. Oh, wonderful. That's an amazing story. And so did the practice then help you heal from that tragic fall that you had? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, after not walking for almost a year, I walked with a completely normal gait in less than two weeks. Wow. And, you know, and I don't want to romanticize too my, my, right. you know, like coming into being as a put on that it was, it was beautiful, but at the same time, it was very painful. Right. You know, it's painful, like moving from what my family was like, but you're an attorney. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you hit your head. <laughs> you got hurt your thinking. Like, no. <laughs> So, I mean, that was, you know, but yeah, it was, it was, here I am, here I am. Yeah. Okay. And it, it definitely helped me heal in so many different ways. And, and by the grace of God and all that is like, I've been helping facilitating that for others as well. Is that the primary focus, would you say then on this practice is of healing? Yes and no. Okay. I mean, it is, and it isn't, you know, because in a sense of like, it depends on how you define healing. If you define healing as being physical healing, then no. Right. If you find healing as it being like a soul healing, as it being emotional, a mental, because then then you start looking at things holistically, because mm -hmm. it is very holistic. You know, when you go to someone, like for example, somebody came to me and not that long ago, and it was this 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 lady who she was getting very ill. She was old, she was in her older, you know, her daughter actually brought her mother to me. And she was, she was older. She was, you know, about to be 90 and she, her condition with everything was getting worse, just like from one day to the other, like really fast. And she came to me, she thought that there was something going on with her. There was like an attachment or something going on. And we had a platica with her, with her mother. I had a platica with her while her daughter was present. And one thing that I, I saw was she had a soul loss. You know, she had, she had had a baby out of a rape. I mean, like it was just so like, and she was just crying and it was bringing those soul pieces back and helping her to like weave back those pieces. And, you know, I gave her a tradition, what was back in the days, what we would do is, and I talk about in veneration, that's a good I gave her, a, I gave her a jade stone, I had to put it in her heart and we had a platica and like, so she could start weaving in those pieces. And I recommended what to do so she could have that transition and, so, I mean, it's, it's not just like a simple, and, and afterwards she actually started feeling better. Mm. She had like, she, she's been like, she had more color, like right after that, she had more color in her face. She was smiling and she mm. has been doing better, but it's, it's not, healing is not like as simple as like, okay, like my, my leg hurts. Right. There's different reasons why that's going on. So in that sense, it is healing, but understanding all the things that it involves. Right. Yeah. And my understanding of healing does encompass that greater aspect of attempting to be whole and connected to everything. And because, you know, one of my primary concerns is our, the state of our environment right now. Mm -hmm. And I feel that in order to help heal that, we all have healing that we have to do. And that's not physical healing. Usually that's a lot of soul healing that needs to occur. So yeah, yes, yeah, so that's always where I come from with my understanding of healing. So there are a couple of things I want to talk about, but I think first, the focus on the book on these veneration rites is on the ancestors. Correct. And I've had a few guests on who have written about the ancestors. And I know that like with healing, it's not just a simple definition always. So I wanted to ask you, who or what are the ancestors? So this was something that, you know, it was really beautiful when I was, when I was studying in, in, you know, grad school, how they identified as being ancestors. There was, I'll say this, there was a lot of conflation. 
you know, like for example, there was the deities they identified as being like at Rikwe, who is one of the earth mother deities, they identified her as an ancestor. And they identified a lot of the rulers eventually as being ancestors and also going across a process of solar, you know, ascension of becoming cosmic cycles of becoming, you know, cacao, becoming trees. So it was, it was, and they were ancestors of the community. Hmm. So it was, it was something that I began seeing too. It's like ancestor could be someone who was part of a vocation, a mentor, you know, somebody that was loved part of a community leader it, could, it was definitely blood but not everybody that was blood necessarily rose to the level of being an ancestor they may be always be remembered and loved you know as a family you know and, and and invited to come and sit with them during you know certain festivities but those who were honored as ancestors it was from a praise like a place of like they were they were you know seen as leaders they were seen as though they were the ones who had the strongest soul energies that can help their heirs and move on and have that line. And it was, it was, it was much more expansive. It was much more of who could be an ancestor. You know, it was, it, was, it could be blood, but it yeah. wasn't necessarily that. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I think that you, you, you definitely wrote about that in the book that the ancestors could be, like you said, someone that was almost like a role model. And it doesn't even have to be someone that you know. And I saw that today. I'm teaching at Regis, which is a Jesuit university here in Denver. And in the building that I was at on the main floor, they had students had built little Day of the Dead altars. And so I encouraged my class. I'm like, after class, go and look, go and look. I don't know that any of them did, but I did. And I noticed that there was a nice mix with them. Some of them were family members, but then there were altars to like Frida Kahlo. There was an altar to Cesar Chavez and to some other folks that I, Selena, there was an altar to Selena too. And I thought, yes, these are all ancestors. They can all be ancestors, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I feel that like that's a beautiful way because that's so expansive. Yeah. It's so expansive because not all of us know some of us do know our blood connections and can look through our DNA, but not all of us have that con that history and that connection. We may have an idea of where our family came from and different stories of that, but when we can say these are my cultural ancestors, right. it's, it, it just and have roots to that. That just makes it much more expansive and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. and 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 you know, and I. I have a, an ancestor altar that I've put together and I want to talk about the altars and whatnot, but, I, and I have a little prayer that I say to the ancestors and some of it is the ancestors named and unnamed because I recognize that I have ancestors that I know no, nothing about. I don't know their names and then blood and spirit. And that's how I kind of connect those ancestors of spirit would be those role models. But then I also include human and non-human. Um, and ancestors of land and ancestors of place. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. So I always try to make a big ancestry. And then I always thank them because I am because they were or that they are, you know. Um, so it, you said that we're rooted by our ancestors. Is that kind of what you mean in a sense, like what I just said, that you are because they were, or do you mean something else? Absolutely. I mean, yes. And all, yes. And, mm -hmm. and also to add on that too, is that it's, it's something that, because a lot of us like, and I say this, and I say us in terms of Latinx folks, mm -hmm. because, you know, we've, we've come here from colonized spaces right. where, you know, our mothers were raped, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, that happened a lot, you know, 90% of our population in Mesoamerica died from airborne diseases. It's, it's just, so much of it was displaced and so it's it's something that we're rooted and we're we're create we creating and we allowing or reinventing ourselves just as our ancestors did too because they did that as well and we're doing it in a ways that makes sense to us today that mm -hmm. makes sense to us be because it's a part of our history and mm -hmm. we're recreating and we're refashioning ourselves to that right. as well Right. And it seems to me that that is one place where that social justice comes in, 
that it's kind of a revolutionary act in terms of reclaiming these traditions. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I can't tell you how many, you know, God bless, you know, <laughs> how many I, folks I had said, well, you know, Rico, this is a really great book. We love your stories. We love your client stories, but can you take out all the academic stuff? And I'm like, mm. okay, most of, first of all, <laughs> when, when people, when I say ancestor, everybody thinks blood's ancestor, right? Right. I need that academic material in there. I need those sources in there. I can't just be like, oh, just trust me. This yeah. is the way my ancestors define ancestors. No, I need hard data in there. Mm -hmm. I need the tombs. I need the facts. I need the codices. I need the myth. I need that all in there. So no, I'm sorry, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> so that in itself was revolutionary, you know, in the publishing industry. Mm. You know, it's like, I'm going to bring all these in. I'm going to bring these different narratives because they need to be in there. Yeah. Would they need to be reclaimed? They need yeah. to be reclaimed in main to mainstream audiences. You know, they we have yeah. access to them in academia, but not in the mainstream. Right. You know, mainstream, most of us we grew up in, you know, elementary school knowing that our ancestors just all they did was sacrifice. And mm. that was it. All right. You know, that was it. It's like, no, we did a lot more than that. The it's, yeah. we're more than the government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's, it's so important, I think, to reclaim these and to make that bridge out of academia to bring the information out because in academia, it's that kind of, you know, the ivory tower as they call it, but the, the, the information is like guarded and that's actually one of my criticisms of academia is because they're always speaking in this academic language that prohibits other people from accessing it. And I feel that one of my jobs is to take all of that and give it to the world and try to translate it into common language that people can understand and utilize and think about. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. That it needs to be. Yeah, language that people can relate to, that people understand. Yeah. It, it needs to be that way too. And the sources need to be there too. Yeah. You know, yeah. in a way that, that makes sense to us. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciated both aspects of your book. I appreciated the yeah. academic aspect and I appreciated the um, personal that you brought in, and but also the practices themselves. And that's another question. This is all kind of connected to this idea of, kind of reclamation in a sense. And with the colonization, and this is appropriation. And I like the way that you phrase this because you hear a lot about cultural appropriation, but you use the term, well, there's appropriation and then misappropriation. So I was wondering if you could maybe uh, discuss that a little bit. You know, so in 20, 2010 and earlier, actually, no, this is like in 1990, when I, when I first like, you know, cause in the time when there was a lot of this social justice, I was introduced and I got involved in raising awareness and monies for the, for the Zapatistas, the EZLN, you know, and, and, and I also got like exposed to other, other indigenous people that one of them was the Pan Maya movement, you know, that in Guatemala and it was it, when I was hearing these things, it was like they were reappropriating what it was to be Maya. They were Kiche, and there were different indigenous groups of peoples, but they were saying, you know what, we're going to reclaim, we're going to recoin the term Maya, but we're going to tell you what is. We're, we've been called Maya by y'all. <laughs> we're not Maya, but you know what, we're going to, that's it, we're Maya, but we're going to tell you what Maya is. We're going to start, you know, claiming our agency and our sovereignty to be able to do that and that was just like that was okay that was like strategic essentialism you know aka like reappropriating you know it's like yeah. it was it was just like awesome I was like oh my god this is awesome and then and then it was like okay so and then also seeing too because that is a lot of what religion is it's 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 appropriation yeah. hello Christianity the Christmas tree like all <laughs> these different like tradition like you name it what is it it's that is and you know it's it's not necessarily bad or good it's it's a lot of different things it's a lot of different things but there is misappropriation when people have erased 
you know, where these traditions come from. And when it's, and it's usually of, yeah, BIPOC, BIPOC mm -hmm. cultures, where they don't give props of, this is where it came from. This is where, you know, where we study, this is, you know, this is, this is from this indigenous group and, and recognizing that it just kind of got erased and like, oh, it's just, this is what it is. Mm. You know, and so there's, is it, there's a distinction because what I saw happening too, now, now in a lot of the, the younger folks that I work with, a lot of the Gen Z's and some younger millennials too, was they were scared to identify with their indigenous roots. Mm. They were scared, like they didn't have, like, do I have that right? Can mm. I do that? I, I don't feel like I can do that. Because back in my days, I'm a Gen X, I'm old school Gen yeah. X. We were in the streets. We were like, we didn't cross the border. The border <laughs> crossed us. We're like, we're indigenous. We're, my blood is red, like totally in your face, like yeah. reclaiming our indigeneity, reclaiming that. And it was beautiful. And now I'm seeing these younger folks, like, because there has been, and that's a very much a cultural colonization, this very assiduous, like cultural colonization of, do we have that right to claim mm -hmm. our indigeneity? Mm -hmm. And it's because it's like, oh no, but you're appropriating. It's like, well, hello, welcome to the cultural development of history, of culture, of everything, but there is misappropriation. Let's get things straight. Yeah. Because then yeah. It, when you don't, people get scared. People get, and that's what started happening. It's like, no, let, let's look at things. Let's look at things because I don't want my folks to like being scared of like claiming their mm -hmm. roots because that's not, that's not okay. I did not be on, I was not on the streets. I was not protesting. I was not doing all these things in my younger days and still still doing it now in my writing. So they would be scared. Absolutely not. I want them to claim it with like pride, with love. And yeah, so that's why I make those distinctions because I'm very like leery about those distinctions. Yeah. Yeah, well, I found it very important and uh, nuanced, and I appreciated it. And and I can share with you the Gen X solidarity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had it going, man. <laughs> um, do you find that there are a lot of people in this younger generation that are seeking, aside from the fear that they may not, feel like they have a right to do this but do you find that there is this quest though from many of them to find their ancestry their roots absolutely i mean absolutely that's and that's that's one of the things and that's what i've been because i i have the, a mentorship and that's what i mm -hmm. help in the first three months and it, you know and i and i felt like maybe i shouldn't have started three three months this way because i have mm -hmm. a lot of people going <gasps> like their eyes, like, like popping open. Like, what did I get myself into? I thought I was going to talk like how to roll an egg. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? We're talking about decolonization, colonization, you know, and, and I, I bring those things up of like decolonizing. And I, I deal with that, like right up front. It's like, okay, what does this look like for us? Because there are a lot of people, but there are all those questions like, can I do this? Hmm. Can I do this? Do I have a right to be doing this? Who am I to be able to do this? And that's what I, we talk about moving mm -hmm. through and reclaiming it and looking at to see where have been, you know, where, where have been the shifts mm -hmm. and what, how did that happen when a lot of indigenous people started claiming their agency? Because yeah. it scared a lot of folks and like, oh, like, let's question the things. Let's look at these things and let's continue to get involved. Because if we don't feel that connection to our indigenous roots, people don't get involved. Right. People like, I don't have that right. I'm not them. But if we feel like we're them, then we'll ask questions. Mm. Yeah, and, and yeah, I do see it. Thank God. You know, I'm, I'm so yeah. grateful. But I have a lot of folks and that's what I, we work on. And that was one of the first things. It's like, before we're going to get to like the healing part and what how you heal with curanderismo, let's like get through like decolonizing your mind. Yeah. And, and the decolonizing the mind is something that we all have to do. Not just... Uh -huh people from indigenous background, but white people need to decolonize their minds. Everybody has to. No, I have, I have some, I have some like ladies, like I have this one lady in Wales, like beautiful. Cause I have lots of people, like, white folks. I have different BIPOC folks like involved in the curanderismo because they're, they're drawn to it. Mm. They're drawn to it. And they ask, do I have a right to be able to do this? I'm scared. And do I have, and it's like, you know what, honey, do it from a space of integrity. Yeah. Do it in a way that honors you. And that's also part of their decolonizing process. And I help them through that too. 
Because there's also like, do I have that right to study this? Do I have yeah. right to be involved in this? I don't know. And it's like, no, you're you're also decolonizing too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I I can say that you know, just personally, like with my ancestor altar, I have things that are meaningful for me and some of my background. I do not because I would say that this would be misappropriation if I just stock it full of things from like day of the dead ceremonies that you can go out and purchase at Trader Joe's or something. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's all relevant to my background. And I think that every culture, as far as I know, studying religion myself has a kind of ancestor relationship, a relationship with the ancestors. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And that is so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Why would someone want to develop a relationship with their ancestors? Well, along with the fact that it's part of our identity and mm-hmm. part, it's, I mean, identity, you know, like who we are, who we are, but it's also too that our ancestors, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of faith, having like faith in like the magical, the mystical, that there's something mm-hmm. beyond us. And I've seen it too. I've seen it too, where my ancestors stepped in and like, oh, honey, you you want to sell that your prior house? <laughs> Sold it in less than two weeks, you know, like mm-hmm. different miracles, like along with allowing that too, they also provide guidance, mm-hmm. solace. They also guide us. They also, And we also help them. You know, it's, it's this beautiful reciprocal relationship that we can develop that goes beyond the mundane because without the mundane, we can get depressed. Life is boring. What what is the richness? Oh, buying something, getting this, getting Mm -hmm. that, getting that. Like after a while that gets dull. Mm -hmm. We need like, that's where the magic is. That's where the beauty is at in life is connecting to something beyond that we can see something that we can feel in our hearts and our souls and our spirits. That's where the magic happens. And that's how, you know, a lot of people that come to me to press, it's like, I, one of my first questions is like, how's your faith? They're like, well, I don't go to religion. Like, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> Not talking about religion. I'm talking about like, how is your faith? What do you believe in? Let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. And that's when then they start lighting up after a while. So how can we help our ancestors? So when like, well, there's many ways, you know, like for example, like on the altar, you know, one of the, one of the ways that my indigenous ancestors and what I still do too, is they provide things that, of course, like what you were saying, like prayer is one of the things, because it's it's as simple as like, if anyone's seen the movie Coco, I'm not mm. like a big fan of like Disney, but I I mean, it's okay, whatever, right? Yeah. But, you know, the way Coco, they had Coco, like they had a picture of this, this, you know, somebody would remember him and, you know, then he was like, his soul energy was coming stronger and stronger when they, somebody would put a picture of them. Like, it's something as simple as that, mm. that we remember our ancestors, that we leave them out. Like, it, it's just having a picture. Maybe leaving incense for them, maybe leaving water, maybe leaving some some of their favorite foods, just a remembrance, a prayer, a thank you, a thank you for helping me. Thank you for guiding me. That on the other side, because the altar acts as a portal, hmm. you know, and we put specific things like, for example, we can put a mirror, mirrors act as portals. You know, that was like something that indigenous, you know, obsidian mirrors, turquoise, pyrite, water, fire, candles, you know, earth too. There's different things that act as portals, right? So by by they allow us to commune. And just with that communing, whatever wish, whatever energy we send out to our ancestors, that helps strengthen their soul energies. And that is reciprocal because we have that connection with them and they can then help us mm. intervene more ready and more readily in our lives. Mm. And, and- it's really fun. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, and (laughs) yeah, well, and I'm interested in healing kind of family trauma that gets passed down. And I don't know that people actually think about that so much is that, you know, I always say, you know, we're all kind of traumatized, (laughs) you know, we're all kind of broken some way or another. And we, you know, we definitely have that relationship with our parents, but then they have the relationship with their parents. It just kind of keeps going back. And it seems to me that, you know, that's my interest is trying to heal that lineage there. And I think, like you said, it's not just me, but it's the ancestors as well that I'm trying to heal. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's something that, you know, I've developed over, you know, a while, like since I began, like back in 
since I got my first bundle, I would say in 99, that's when I really started my first ancestral bundle and started creating an altar and working from there. And then having an, what I call, I call them at my entourage. Those are the ones yeah. who step in to heal me, to heal my ancestors. Their an- like we heal. We're like the team that we're healed and we heal others. I call them in when, because there's certain things that get passed on. Mm. You know, it's, 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 things get passed on. Curses yeah. get passed on. Yeah. You know, wrongdoings get passed on. And it's not just in our culture that we believed in that. You know, right. in balancing those wrongdoings, a lot of cultures, some, some, they call it karma, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we also have that understanding that there's that reincarnation, that we come back and we have affinities, we have energies that keep us connected. Mm. So it's good to like, somebody comes in and starts healing those lines as well and offering that healing to other. And I, I have like ways of, you know, just basic things of like how to do that for our families, just at least at minimum for wrongdoings and curses. And of course we can offer whatever from that. I have like the basic for that. And then we can springboard from that and offer other kinds of healings to our ancestors as well. Yeah. And we inherit good things too. Absolutely. Yeah. And it seems like that this building, this relationship with the ancestors helps us tap into that. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, when I began connecting with my great, great grandmother, that was when I I began remembering, I knew, well, actually it was like, I would say I was like eight years old when I began really, it was, I mean, I was almost connected, but really connecting to my great, great grandmother. I already knew I maybe five, like I felt that there was this connection. She was already teaching me how to mm. do baritas, sweep limpias. When I was five, when I was eight, working with like the flowers and healing my sore throat with bougainvillea, with lemon, with salt and knowing what to do. And that was very much that connection because I was very much, because my mom was at school a lot mm. in college when I was very, very young. My As I explained in the book, you know, my father was killed when I was very young. So my mom went to college and I was with my grandmother and my great grandmother a lot in my younger adolescence. So seeing my, my great grandmother, like how she, she healed, she cooked and her stories and, and being around that, that was infused that interest of my grandmother's and understanding that healing was very much infused in me, you know, more so, more so than maybe anybody else in my family. Hmm. Yeah. And it seems like, what's important here as well is as much as is possible. And I know it's not always possible, but to find the family stories. Mm. Yes. 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 Yes, absolutely. I always, I always recommend, you know, to ask stories, even if like the memories aren't like, you know, because sometimes I'll ask, like, I'll ask my, my, you know, my gra- my grandmother, she's adorable. Sometimes she'll say like, my back hurts because I was a nurse. It's like, no, grandma, that's not why you're in your back. <laughs> you were a nurse a long, long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's because I'm lifting people. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot, you know, so it's, it's trying to get those moments of like spaces of like still listening and hearing those stories to our, with our family members, but still yeah. taking those opportunities to ask. Yeah. Now, I, I want to ask you about how someone would go about starting working with the ancestors. But before then, I just want a little bit of clarification on the bundle. What is an ancestor bundle? So an ancestor bundle can be a cloth. It's a cloth, a hide, and it's something that's infused because that that was also believed too, that our ancestors were soul energies. Hmm. And those soul energies, as I mentioned at the very beginning, could be infused in our cacao trees and our sacred gardens and our sacred items, our, which are Bawatsli, our in a water term for sacred items, Nipia items. And that could be the bundle itself and our ancestors. And this is this goes back to my indigenous ancestors where the bundles themselves would be guiding them. They had in the codices, they had speech, speech scrolls above the bundles, like guiding, guiding, you know, guiding them what to do, where to go. So it is something, and I, I talk about the process of how to, activate how to cleanse and how to activate our bundles and welcome in Mm. our bundles you know which again could be any kind of cloth usually like for example i have some really precious bundles that are we bundles um some that are 
Maya bundles that have the creation stories that that was one of my first bundles. Um, and they could be something that it could be as, as like a, just a handkerchief. Mm. doesn't have to be anything fancy, but it's something that is special to us. And we go through a process of having our ancestors infuse them by honoring them with the cardinal spaces and what are understood as the non-ordinary realms being the upper world, middle world, and the underworld. And I explained all of that in my book on how right. to do it. It's, yeah. it's simple, beautiful, and lovely. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I was just a little, because in my brain, when I think of a bundle, I think of a collection of things. And I know in the book, you were actually pretty clear about it being a cloth, but I'm like, I just want to ask, <laughs> just to make sure. You put different things in the bundle too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We put our Apra Watsley, our Olympia tools. We put our divination tools in that bundle. Okay. All right. You know, and that's, 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 and sometimes our ancestor bones were in the bundle itself. Sometimes okay. their cloths were in the bundle. What we use for healing was in the bundle. Okay. So it's a cloth and it's like what we put in it gets part of that. And it, those items also get infused with our ancestor soul energies as well. Yeah. And it's something then that you can take with you. So it can almost serve like a altar on the go. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. So how would someone go about starting the work with the ancestors? Well, one of the things that, you know, it depends. One of the things I would ask first is what is the connection with family? Mm -hmm. Some people have great connections with family. They have lots of pictures of their great grandmother, their grandmother. They have, they have access to that. And I would ask, it's like, okay, well, you have that great connection. Is that where that's what resonates with you? Because it has to feel in alignment with you. Right. And there's some like, well, there's, you know, it, it depends on what the connection is with the family. So assuming there is a good connection, I would, and they do want to connect with their great grandmother or their great grandfather or their even beyond, I would then recommend that they put that picture on their altar and just start connecting, start making offerings of maybe incense or copal of water, whatever they start with simple, start simple. And maybe, and I have a, you know, a, a journey, a meditative journey guide of going within what we call el Sagrado Corazón, the sacred heart of connecting with them and asking and start talking to them and relating to them in that way. It, it's something that's that's just beautiful, right? And if someone does not have a connection with their family, maybe for whatever reason, they're just like, no, I'm not really, I don't feel that, you know, hmm. just for whatever reason, maybe there's a falling out or whatnot. I would ask, well, do you know where your family comes from? What area? Where where do they come from? Where are they? You know, and then I would ask to just do a little research on that area. What were the peoples that came from there? Look into the culture. Look and see if that resonates with them and bring in maybe cultural images, maybe sacred items, maybe mythologies, maybe a book, you know, something that represents that and start an altar from that, you know, and, and it, cause it's, it's, it is connecting to that and maybe putting it next to the bed too. Cause it is also said when we start opening up that door, our soul energy travels at nighttime when we sleep and connects with our ancestors mm -hmm. and they can start con con connecting with us while we're dreaming, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's, it's opening up that door in that space to seeing, I, I, I want to find out like where the person is at. You know, where are they at? What because it like I said, it has to feel good. It has to feel and it should feel yummy in the heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Anything worthwhile should feel yummy in the heart. <laughs> I, <think. laughs> I like that phrase. I'm gonna I'm gonna start using that a lot. I don't want to appropriate it from you, but <laughs> feel free. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you. Well, and I like that you wrote in the book that every time we engage in an ancestral veneration, right, we strengthen the soul animating energies of our ancestors, but also, and we, and you've talked about this, but also our own energies as well. Yes. Yes. Cause, cause oftentimes too, I'm sorry, were you, you're going to say something. No, 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 no. Cause, cause oftentimes too, sometimes well, a lot of the times when because it's, it's common. We have wounds, we have traumas, we have things that are going on that happen in our lives where a part of us, you know, it could be as simple as like, I remember one time where I had somebody and I was, I was singing and I was at a, a I was at a school and 
I, there was somebody there in, in the audience that I didn't want there, you mm. know, and I, and I was like, oh, I saw him and I got shocked and I was doing, you know, solo and I was singing and my voice cracked. And I remember he looked down and his, his face went like that. And there was another time where I was singing in a ceremony and mm. I was, I was singing a solo and I had that memory and a soul piece came back to me. Mm. Because I was singing in joy and I was reclaiming myself. So there, I mean, it doesn't have to be anything like that's something small. It was huge. But it was a memory that I had forgotten about. And it wasn't until I was in that space where I was singing that flow. So what I recommend too is sometimes is I recommend like if someone has had a trauma in their lives, you know, because when we have traumas, they leave and they go into the non-ordinary realms. They don't go there to get traumatized. They go there because they're getting the medicine that they didn't get here in this realm, you know? And that's what, this is This is an indigenous understanding of susto, right? Of, of soul loss. And so I say, put a picture of yourself with your ancestors that of you that represents that that time in your life, that space in your life. That way your ancestors can take care of you, that mm. part of you in the non-ordinary realms and help guide you mm. back to that soul retrieval. Mm. You know, so that's just an, another beautiful way mm. to, that we can help and get energized from that as well. Mm. I like that. And it, it, I don't know if I can express this adequately, but it was something that I was thinking about in terms of working with the ancestors is when we talk about the healing of the ancestors now, we're talking about in the ancestral realm, if I can use that language. But I was kind of curious, can the work that we do now with the ancestors, do you think it's possible that it can actually help them in their lives as they were living them? Almost yeah. like jumping across time in a sense. Well, I mean, I'm I'm also like, you know, trained in shamanism. So I'm yeah. very much quantum. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. And I always, I always pray for that as well. You yeah. know, if people are open to that, like, and I guide them, like when I work with people, people, I feel like, oh, that's too much. It's not, that's yeah, going to yeah. be, you know, that's, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm all about that. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> Good, good. His realities. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking in terms of, I know that there's been some actually scientific studies done on retro causation, mm. which is just that, that we can actually affect our past. Yeah. And so I was thinking about that because I know some of the trauma in my family and I was like, you know, it, is there any way that I can help heal that as they are living it? Yes. So yes. in that sense, though, doesn't that make us something like an ancestor as well? We are the living ancestors. Yeah. And we step up to it. Hmm. You know, today, that was one of the things I, I wrote. I wrote a post and because I, you know, I, I felt like this, this weight today of what's everything that's going on in Palestine. And, yeah. you know, part of me was, just, and I, I was reading this article about how like, this other bombing and, you know, everything was rubbled. And I was just there was a part of me that just felt really, really heavy and, and crying a little bit. And, and I heard my ancestors and I heard them. I said, I said, Miha, you know, that means like, like the daughter, like, mm -hmm. like be that light, pray for you're strong, pray for those, pray for them, pray for their healing, pray for their freedom, pray for, pray for anyone that needs that, that healing, that love, let's do it together. And I saw myself in this beautiful ball of sacred geometry. You know, that's mm -hmm. how I, that's why I, I experienced the quantum, you know, this, this beautiful, like, and I saw just flooding myself in this earth and just loving and just being in that. And right when I was doing that, no joke, like three little dragonflies, like, like were like flying and I was in the urban area, you know, <laughs> it's out in nature, it's an urban, I was like in the streets, like, you know, it's like three little, little dragonflies are like flying around me, like, yeah. <laughs> so cool. you know it was and I was like that's what that for me was confirmation hmm. that for me was confirmation like yes you know not just my ancestors but because we're all connected yeah we're all connected you know and yeah. then as an ancestor I have that obligation and responsibility not yeah. in a, not in a heavy hard way but because I know I can right 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 yeah well you know I have to admit or say that you are full of light. It just kind of 
beams through in the conversation and, and the smile. So I, I so am so grateful uh, for the work that you're doing because, and I always say that anyone who is involved in healing work is doing a great, great, great service to the world. Um, so I have just a couple of final questions, but one before I get to the final questions is what else would be involved with the ancestral work? And I know you go into this in the book and I encourage everyone to get a copy of the book, but what else would be involved with this other than say creating an altar? Oh my goodness. Well, along with the ancestral bundles, it could be dancing, cacao ceremony, because I also include cacao ceremonies in there too. Also going on nature walks and connecting it would be also because there's different of course like art creation creativity it would be also healing ourselves and doing limpia rites for ourselves Mm -hmm. because that's a big part of it too because i i my ancestors know that i am strong because this weekend i i I was really not in a good space good set i was just kind of like like a little like you know my heart was a little little sad a little heavy from that so they're like do baños cleanse yourself <laughs> do a safe limpia you know go play with your puppy go in the park do the happy things you need to do so you can pray for others hmm. you know because that's also a part of it too is getting to a space of like lifting ourselves up so we can be that for ourselves hmm. and hopefully for yeah. others too yeah and the limpia that you've mentioned a few times is that just is that just a ritual is that a cleansing ritual so there's so the limpias that i have in the book one of some of them are as simple as doing what i call baños they're mm-hmm. they're it's it's making really really concentrated tea like almost mm-hmm. 60 cups of concentrated tea and putting it into the tub right yeah. and they talk about the procedure putting two cups of epsom salt cleansing the space that's one and then of course cleansing our spaces you know what i have white fire olympias with smudging with what are saku medios and i describe those two and also as simple as like creating limpia soaps Mm -hmm. like in the shower like like with a special soap that you make and i have the the recipe so you can cleanse it we can cleanse ourselves you know or like making florida water and doing divination work and cleansing ourselves with the florida water and putting the florida water on our ancestral altar you know and also doing you know baridas sweet limpias with what i have a recipe in there for doing with a lemon with, you know, this is a whole lemon and then putting it on the tobacco, you know, like working with, with different, also working with the elements in that way Mm -hmm. too, you know, because there are also our allies as well. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for the recipe of the Florida water, by the way, in the book, (laughs) Uh, I, I, I love, I love Florida water and it was awesome. I'm glad you put in the soap because every now and then I will go and purchase a bar of Florida water soap. (laughs) <laughs> and now I want to try to make my own uh, just for the cleansing. And I also liked the the bath with the coffee maker <laughs> because I've gone, I, where I used to live, I used to live in Pasadena and there was a, a little botanica not so far away. Oh, and yes. so I would go well, there. Like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'd go there every now and then and get some of the candles. And then they had the pre-made uh, things for the baths with all the herbs and the flowers and everything. And but you gave the recipe and I'm like, Ooh, I'm going to try that. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, I know that we are uh, unfortunately out of time, uh, but let me ask you the final questions. And this is, what are you working on next? What do you have coming up? So, you know, when this, this airs, this will be, we will actually be starting the soul retrieval series, which takes people through the cardinal spaces. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a series it's going to be the last Sunday of the month. And it's going to be a series where people start working with with pieces of of any kind of like wounds and start welcoming them back and understanding and working with that process. Um, And also to um, one of them is also going to be working with our animal guides Mm. because they're also our our helpers too. Yeah. So that's, and they can find me at realizeyourbliss.com. That's where they can see the events on there, but there's always fun things going on. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Wonderful. And when uh, and that begins in January? Yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. I will do my absolute best to get this out actually before Christmas. I'll try to get this out before Christmas Yay. for you. And that was realizeyourbliss.com. That's correct. Okay. I will put a link for that in the show notes and the video description, uh, as well as links for your book. 
it was a very interesting read. And like I said, I think I thought you did an outstanding job of balancing that academic and the more personal and practices and whatnot. So it's a, it's an excellent read. Excellent read. Thank so, you. Thank you. Well, Erica, thank you so much for your time today and your presence. And again, you are just full of light. It just beams across the internet to me. So, so thank <laughs> you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for these lovely questions. It was a beautiful interview. Yeah, well, thank you. And that's a wrap on episode 110 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience. Now, before anything else, I would like to take this moment to thank my newest patron, Rick Beathy. Rick, your support is truly appreciated. It is with support like yours that I can continue with the podcast. So thank you. I am incredibly grateful and humbled by your generosity. If anyone else would like to be like Rick and support me in my mission of exploring spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's relationship to a living earth, you too can sign up for my Patreon. Perks for patrons include early access to episodes and uh, ad-free episodes, shout-outs to members, a members-only Facebook page, access to the Rebel Spirit Radio Discourse server, and a monthly book club where we explore books discussed on the podcast, uh, spiritual and philosophical classics, and books related to the cocktail apocalypse. You can find the link for my Patreon in the show notes or video descriptions. And of course, if you prefer, uh, you can still make a one-time donation uh, via PayPal. Uh, I will be tremendously grateful for any support that you can provide. Another way that you can help the podcast is to share it on social media and share it with friends and family members. That really is one of the best ways you can help and support the podcast. Help me grow my audience. So if you feel moved by the rebel spirit, and you know, I sure hope that you do, then please, by all means, help share the good news. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to or watching Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.